if you're willing to put it on your dog, put it on yourself. Let's see what happens. So here I've got a dog tra collar on, on my own neck here. You should be able to see the green light flashing there, which shows that the thing is on. And uh, hopefully you can see that the contact points there are connecting with the neck as well. Now I'm going to show you two things um, which are involved in low-level electric stimulation training. One is the page button, the page function, which I think I've probably shown before, but I want to show what effect that has. And the other one is the nick button. And I'm going to take it up and show you how that feels as that nick button is pressed. Okay? So if we take the remote here, I just want to demonstrate. I'm being straight up. The remote is turned, let me just turn this down to zero. The remote is on zero, okay, and it's turned on. You can see that the green light's flashing. If I press the page button on the remote, the orange corresponds to the orange, you will see the green light stay on on this collar and you should be able to hear it vibrate. Okay, that's a vibration on the collar. So when people talk about, I use a vibrate in order to facilitate a successful recall or a successful redirect, of that dog's attention from whatever it happens to be on on that time onto me, that is what a vibrate is. So I'll show it you again. There's the vibrate buzzing away, all right? It does absolutely nothing whatsoever apart from vibrate. So it's a sensation that I can feel. Now, if I stick a collar on a dog, a remote collar onto a dog and start pushing the button, it's going to mean nothing, nothing whatsoever. You may get an initial um, sort of like what was that, an initial you know, non-recognition of the actual sensation that's being felt because nothing else in life feels like it, but it won't train your dog. Um, so I, I've got to state this absolutely categorically, I cannot state enough how I am completely and utterly against an individual with a problem with a dog going out, buying a remote training aid, putting it onto their dog, and by remote training aid I mean sp spray collars, um, e-collars, vibrate collars, anything really, putting it onto the dog and expecting the dog to either break the behavior that they're involved in, learn from um, the, the correction that they receive as a result of the collar, um, or you know, desist in sort of like trying to engage in that behavior again in the future. It will not happen, okay? All you will do is look to um, screw your dog up. In a nutshell, you will look to confuse your dog, you will create avoidance, you will create fear, you will create all the fallout that people talk about is potentially possible by the misuse of a remote training aid. Okay, so we don't ever endorse the use of buying a remote collar, putting it onto a dog, and start fiddling around with buttons and dials, and it, that's not how it works, okay? It's all about association. It's all about classical conditioning. Pavlov and his dog, you know, the bell rings, the white lab coat appears, the scent of the food powder is puffed into the dog's face and the dog salivates. It's something that the dog does over a period of time without conscious thought. I feel the vibrate, it means that I turn. I hear the whistle, it means that I turn. That's one part. The next part is when I've turned, what do I do? Well, through operant conditioning, through learning, I understand that by coming back, I get reward. By coming back, I get released to go back to what it was that I was doing in the first place. Okay, so they are your key components of um, training, if you like, uh, is your classical new operant conditioning. Um, one is basically where the environment controls what you do, and the other one is that you control what the environment has to offer. Two very, very important parts in training a dog. So again, just to underline that point, please do not think for one moment that um, we endorse the um, going out and buying, ordering of remote training aids without a thorough input from somebody who knows exactly what they are doing with a remote training aid, somebody who is able to demonstrate it consistently, um, somebody who isn't, uh, isn't afraid to put collars on themselves and show what it is that they're using, okay? And somebody as well who will insist that for the first couple of sessions or the, fir the first session, unless you've got a dog that understands various aspects, which I, I, won't, I won't go into that now because it's too big a topic in itself, but somebody who basically will put a collar on your dog but won't start pressing buttons until they've done some training with that dog. Okay, and that training generally needs to be done through reward. So, collar's on then, and as I think you can probably see there, we're on zero on the remote. Okay, and I'm going to take it up and I'm going to show you what I feel as it goes up. So, I know that I'll feel nothing on number five, so I hit number five on the button there. You can see the green light flashing. You should be able to see it flashing on my collar, it corresponds. Okay, so I've got nothing whatsoever from that. And what you can see is that the little dial at the top is, is on an N, which is basically a NIC stimulation. It's called a NIC stimulation, which is a fraction of a second of a stimulation. So no matter how long I hold that button down for there, it isn't going to do anything other than that single fraction of a second correction. 
I need to keep tapping it in order to get the correction, the correction, the correction, okay? If that's what I'm looking to achieve, which comes into training at some stages. Okay, so now I move it up and we're going up to, where are we? Number eight, and I tap again. Can I feel anything? I can feel it ever such a slight, ever such a slight, you can see that? Ever such a slight, um, it basically feels like something's just stroking the side of my face there. Okay, so now we'll go, nice. Um, now we're going to, um, that's quite nice actually that it's raining because there's also the big thing about, oh, well, what if it gets wet, you're going to electrocute yourself. You can see it, it's happening. Number 10, okay, we take it up to number 10. Again, slight sensation, slight tap, I'm feeling from my ear down towards the collar there. Okay, so there we go, and we're going to go up to uh, number 13. Yep, slightly bigger sensation now. Probably feels a little bit like a... You might even be able to see a little pulse in the neck there, I don't know. Yeah, you could probably... Just down here, you can probably see a little pulsation in the neck as I'm tapping that button there. All right, so when you see... Oh, but I can see the dog's skin moving, so the dog's being fried, or the dog's being absolutely electrocuted. Well, I'm going to just bring that in close again, and hopefully you might be able to see that. It feels like somebody tapping. All right, somebody tapping on the side of my neck. So now I'm going to take it up to 15. Same thing again, exactly the same thing. It feels like, I guess you can see the green light going, so the, the collar is tapping. feels like somebody's tapping a little bit harder on the side of my neck. Um, if you think that I'm some sort of like <laughs> Teflon skin individual who won't feel a stimulation from, for um, electric or static, you're wrong. You're very wrong. Okay, so now we're up to number 17. Tapping 17 now, starting to feel a little bit more of a nag on the side of my neck there. You should see the skin might be able to see the skin pulsating beneath the collar if I close my mouth. Okay, you see that? So that's what it feels like. Yes, it's caused because, because there's obviously a, um, uh, a connection between the two contacts, um, which is traveling through the skin, so it's making the skin move as I do it. And I'm now gonna make it up to number 19. Same thing, really, not a great deal different, slightly harder tap. And I'm gonna take myself up to 21. Slightly harder tap again. Take myself up to 23. Again, it feels like a, how can I describe it? It almost feels like somebody's, um, you can see the side of the neck there. You see the movement on the side of the neck, but I'm, I'm able to talk through it. You know, I'm not, there's nothing happening. It's just a tapping that happens on the side of the neck. And you can see as I'm pushing the green button, this is how often I'm creating that tap sensation as I move, All right? And it goes on. So I go up to 24 and I tap at 24 and I go up to 26 and I tap at 26, and I go up to 28, and I tap at 28. Now it's starting to get a little bit more of a sort of, like that would get my attention. Do you know what I mean? For anybody who's ever uh, been a fisherman or a fisher person, um, if you get a knock off a mackerel or something like that, or a knock off a, tr a trout on the end of your rod, and that sort of like dink, that's what that feels like. So it feels like a, um, a, shoot a shooting sensation of the side of the neck. Okay, so I'm going up to 20. I'll take it up to 30. I don't go, I don't train above. There's number 30. Okay, we're pushing on number 30 now, which is causing a jolt in the shoulder. If you see, you see that? Okay, so the shoulder is jolting. Yet yeah, it still isn't what I would describe as painful. That's an involuntary reaction throughout the muscles as the stimulation is delivered. Okay, so I'm still able to talk. I'm still able to give a commentary whilst that is being pushed. And you can see how often I'm pushing it and you can see the shoulder moving. But the fact is, what isn't happening there is pain. What is happening is a prickle, and that is completely involuntary. That isn't me yelping through pain or moving through pain. That is my bodily reaction to the um, stimulation that's being delivered between the two currents. All right? Okay, so now we're going to take it right back down to what I would generally train at, which is around about, that was at 30, around about 11. Okay, on my own labs, generally, I'm talking about 11 for... Um, when we're talking about modifying, okay, we're talking about behavior modification um, and that's where you're looking to sit um, and train at. Every dog is different obviously, but roughly on an average you, you're between somewhere between um, 10 and 20 um, for low level electric stimulation training. Number eight, which is the one that I'm tapping there now, which just is absolutely, I mean it feels like, God knows, it feels like a fly landing on, on the side of my neck really. That's the sort of level of simulation that gets my Labrador's attention. And I'm going to demonstrate it because I've got Bonnie. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to demonstrate it, first of all, with the pager function, all right? So just to remind you, there's the vibrate of the pager. I'm now going to demonstrate that pager function on my own lab. If I take it, I'm not going to call her. I'm just going to press the pager function and let's see what happens, okay? She's up there somewhere. So I press and let's see what happens. I don't know if you can see this, look. 
Good girl. Good girl. Yes. All right, so my Labrador understands that the pager function on a remote collar, not that, not that it's used like that because she doesn't... There you go, baby. I can call come and she'll do the same thing, or I can blow a whistle and she'll do the same thing. But what you can do, or what, I, or what I'm able to, to achieve, is that while she's out of distance, wherever she is, I press that pager function, which is like your mobile phone on vibrate, or for anybody who can remember, who's old enough to rem remember and brave enough to admit it, a pager. It feels like a pager going off. Um, so you tap the pager, so there's on the side of the dog's neck, and it, because of um, the associations of classical and operant conditioning, the dog understands that that means to return to the handler where reward is forthcoming, all right? Reward doesn't have to be forthcoming all the time. It's important that I stress that. Reward needs to be faded. It must be faded because I don't want a dog who's only going to come back because I think they're going to get food. I want a dog that's going to come back and I'm going to put them on an inter intermittent reward schedule, okay? So that they sometimes get it and they sometimes don't. Think about a gambler and how um, strong a gambling habit is um, in comparison to, say, you put a quid in a machine and got one pound five pence out every single time. They're going to be occasions where you're not going to bother. But if sometimes I get nothing, and other times I get 250 quid, and that 250 quid initially is quite frequent, and then becomes a little bit less frequent, and I break from it, and I come back, and I get 250 quid again, I'm going to get pretty hooked. And that's what we create. We create addicted dogs. We don't create painful, uh, you know, dogs that um, can consider life to be painful. We don't create fearful dogs. We don't create avoidant dogs. Um, and we don't create, certainly don't create dogs that are afraid to experiment of their own initiative. I hope that's of some sort of benefit to you anyway. It's just, there are, I know that there are lots of people who hear the word electric collar, hear the word shock collar, hear the word e-collar, hear the word remote trainer, and they automatically assume that it's going to be something that's going to send your head into orbit. So I've just put it on my own neck. I've done the same with Cho Chains, just to show you um, what it entails. Thank you.